What if one day you woke up in another world? Living for almost 100 years, in a life eating nothing but fruits, being friends with nature spirits, and having a home called a forest? Well, it seems like that's exactly what happened to our main protagonist in this story. According to Aesir, the life of an elf is pretty much the ideal slow life. Although at first it seems like the perfect life anyone could ask for, as time passes by, Aesir starts to get bored of it. After living like this for 120 years, the High Elf now sets himself off in search of stimulation and thrills. Now that he is already fed up with this kind of life, he starts to realize that it is indeed not the life he wanted to live for the rest of his elf life. As it turns out, Aesir has all the memories of his previous life, which by the way was a world filled with rich products of culture and civilization. That's why he can easily tell that this world he is currently in is scarce of the good stuff. Knowing that the other High Elves don't have any idea what the world has to offer, considering the only thing they have known and love is the forest, Aesir just can't take it anymore. With the knowledge that elves live for more than 1,000 years, and once their physical form perishes, their spirit goes on to linger in nature until the end of the world itself, Aesir, who has played the part for over 100 years, has finally reached his limits. Since his stomach can't keep up on eating fruits for another 800 years, or even until the world ends, he now finally decides to go out there, see, eat, and experience new things. And for him to kickstart that vision, he went on to cut his long silky hair. For some reason, his chest feels lighter now, so he starts to feel much more excited than before. Elves live deep in the forest, in the overwhelmingly vast sea of trees, Pula. So Aesir has no idea what to expect past the elven barrier. However, despite the nervousness, he can't deny the fact that the thrill makes him more excited. Considering there isn't anyone he wants to give his farewells to, he immediately moves out to start his journey into the real world. As soon as he stepped out of the forest, a series of unfortunate events started to bombard him, one after another. But still, he enjoys every challenge like it's a fun game, since along the way he was able to get his hands on some good items like wolf fangs and claws. Aesir started to wonder what kind of items he would be able to make out of them. As a result, he started having thoughts on actually learning some craftsmanship first. But before that, as he reached the end of the valley, he finally got his eyes locked on the first city on sight. Immediately, without wasting any time, he went on to rush to the city gates, only to find out that he needed money to get inside. Since he doesn't have any copper or silver coins in hand, Aesir has no other choice but to wish for a miracle to come by. As he loses hope of ever entering the said city, a girl then calls for him, asking if she can borrow Aesir for a moment. Although confused, Aesir still went on to listen attentively to what the girl had to say. Surprisingly, it seems like the girl is curious to know if Aesir happens to be a high elf. Shocked at first, Aesir ended up frozen in place. But after a while, he then realizes that a high elf appears to be draped in a shimmering light. This is caused by their soul's immortality. So there is no doubt why the girl immediately knew Aesir was one of the high elves, considering his overflowing aura. Now that she has finally confirmed Aesir as one, the girl then goes on to wonder what is a high elf like Aesir doing in a human city like this one. Without even trying to hide it, Aesir went on to straightforwardly state that he just got bored of the forest, and that is why he thought of taking a look around. At first, Aesir thought that the girl would be awkward with him, but surprisingly, it seems like she isn't at all. In fact, she even sees Aesir as a noble one that she should give her respect to. Then suddenly, the girl introduced herself as Irina, a fellow elf who sees herself as Aesir's personal assistant from now on. Although Aesir appreciates Irina's kind offer to give her assistance, he assures her that there's no need to worry at all. But since Irina is the one who helped him pass through the gates, he has no choice but to stick around with her until they get inside. Before they enter, the gates guard informs Aesir of the city rules. As he reads through it, he immediately understands every bit, as it is easy to comprehend. As soon as the signing of papers is already done, Aesir, Irina, and Irina's party immediately enter the city of Vistcourt. When they were inside, Irina asked Aesir if he had any plans moving forward. If he hasn't yet, the party would recommend that he register himself as an adventurer to obtain a form of identification. However, as Aesir thinks of it, it's really not the kind of thing he wants to do at all. It seems like he has plans on making something out of those forest wolf parts he got a while ago, and for him to be able to do such a thing, he needs to find a good blacksmith first. Although there is someone in Irina's mind she can recommend, she somehow can't take the fact that this particular blacksmith is a dwarf. As Aesir thinks about it deeply, he suddenly remembers that according to the elven legend, dwarves ruin the sanctity of nature by stealing fire away and locking it inside the furnace. That's why myths or legends, dwarves and elves just don't get along at all. However, it seems like that's not a problem for Aesir at all. In fact, he is even excited that he gets to see a dwarf for the first time. This made everyone at Irina's party, even Irina herself, shocked. But since Aesir's decision is already fixed, they have no choice but to agree with it. But before all that, 
Aesir went on to give Irina an apla fruit, which is considered an elf's favorite food. Since Irina has helped him get into town, this was Aesir's token of appreciation of some sort. As a result, Irina's decision of not coming with Aesir to the dwarf's blacksmithing shop has now changed, so she goes on to tell him to rest up for the night as they will visit the smith the next day. The next morning, Aesir immediately went to the blacksmith's shop just like he planned. With a huge smile painted on his face, it is pretty apparent that he is definitely excited about this thing one way or another. As he got inside the shop, he was shocked when nobody greeted him back. By the looks of it, it seems like the smith is quite busy with his thing at the moment. After waiting for a couple of minutes, the blacksmith finally arrives, welcoming Aesir with the warmest greetings. However, as soon as he sees Aesir's lengthy ears, the dwarf's expression suddenly changes. He immediately sets things straight with Aesir, saying that he will not sell anything to an elf like Aesir ever in his life. So to avoid any misunderstanding, Aesir went on to state that he was not here today to buy anything. Instead, he wants the dwarf to forge him an item he has envisioned in his mind. Immediately, Aesir went on to show the dwarf the forest wolf's fang he was able to get a while ago. Since he doesn't want any parts of it to go to waste, he is asking the dwarf to make something great out of it. However, it seems like the dwarf doesn't know how to craft it at all considering a fang this size isn't really the kind of thing an amateur could work with. But instead of looking for another blacksmith, Aesir went on to press on complimenting the dwarf of a skill. After all, he is the best one this town has to offer. As a result, even though the blacksmith isn't really keen on working for an elf like Aesir, he has no choice but to grab this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Knowing that he would not be able to work his hands on this kind of material in the near future, the blacksmith went on to agree to work on it himself. On top of that, he also went on to state that Aesir could make a killing as an adventurer, so he might as well consider entering the guild himself. However, it seems like Aesir is not ready to embark on that journey yet. For now, he is planning to craft knives and whatnot like a blacksmith, to the point that he is willing to learn how for the next 10 to 20 years. Hearing this shocked the dwarf, as this was the first time an elf got so genuinely interested in doing such a thing. However, it seems like Aesir has already decided and is now ready to start his journey as a blacksmith elf. Of course, it was natural that Irina was shocked by this sudden decision. After all, elves and dwarves aren't supposed to get along, and now an elf, a high one to be specific, is going to work in a dwarf shop is just weirdly different. However, it seems like Aesir doesn't get why it wouldn't be a problem, since he is doing this because he wants to make some money on the side. With a big stomach like his, having extra cash in his pocket is indeed something he needs to consider. Aside from that, he is also planning on paying Irina back for all the expenses she did to accommodate him in the city. But that is not what bothers Irina the most. The fact that Aesir will now be covered with an iron stench, which is something that frightens the trees, makes him less of an elf from now on. Fast forward, a year has already passed. Irina and her team, White Lake, come by to the blacksmithing shop to buy and repair equipment. It is also quite a fruitful year for the shop, since they have quite more customers than usual. Aside from that, it seems like Aesir has also improved a lot with his smithing skills, but it seems like he is allowed to hammer out nails for now. In addition to that, metal shortage is also one of the things that is causing a lot of grief to the customers. While Aesir is busy with his job, Irina and the others are out on a long-term mission. Since he is planning to move out of the inn, Aesir is waiting for the others to come back to tell them his fixed decision. A few days passed, and a bell on the door made Aesir smile, knowing that this was definitely Irina and the others. However, to his surprise, it seems like something bad has happened to the party. According to one of Irina's comrades, they have received a request from the town of Garalet, which is about two weeks away. However, the party wasn't informed that the Garalet's river had been contaminated. The water spirit there is out of control, and the city has asked them to end its curse. But while the fish are dying in greater numbers, the surrounding vegetation is unaffected. Based on this fact, what's happening in Garalet's river is not a curse, but a pollution. Garalet is a new town established where rich mineral veins were discovered 10 years ago. So that means all of the harm caused by the mine's pollution is being blamed on the water spirit. Aesir then went on to ask what kind of person the Lord of Garalet is. According to Irina's comrade, he is someone who is very eager to expand the mining operations, which simply means that he already knows what the problem is, yet he is still keeping a blind eye. As a result, Irina and her team are now handed the burden of finding a solution to the problem that can only be solved by Garalet's higher-ups. But Aesir would not deny the fact that Irina did the right thing, befriending the water spirit as much as possible, since it would surely prevent the pollution from having any influence over the world. Although Aesir is willing to help them with this matter the best he can, he still wants the group to talk to one more person other than him. Knowing that dwarves have been working with metals since time immemorial, if anyone, they'd be the most well-versed in the harmful effects metals can have. With that being said, they need to seek Master Rockmuncher, aka the blacksmith's help. Upon telling him every detail, the blacksmith offered to investigate the matter himself. At first, Aesir thought it wasn't really necessary, but in the end, he went on to give up, 
considering the blacksmith insisted on doing it again and again. Despite the fact that this matter could result in the inflation of metal prices, Aesir couldn't care less, considering he is a high elf living in the world of men. So he will do what only a knife ears can do. While the dwarves work on his investigation, Aesir and Irina's comrade Martina then visit the site themselves. When they got there, they saw Kreas all weak and frail from holding down the fort the best he could. Upon Aesir's observation, this place is no longer hospitable to humans. That is why, as soon as Irina returns, he will immediately take everyone somewhere safer. When he finally got his eyes locked on Irina, he immediately jumped in to have a noble discussion with the water spirit. As soon as he tags in, the spirit's tail then follows to flash in. Long ago, the indigenous people who lived in the area respected nature deeply. But one day, this land was invaded. The tribe's survivors would be integrated into the new culture, but they never gave up their faith. However, as time passed by, those who opposed the mining projects were exiled. As a result, the people started letting the greedy people take over their land fully, which eventually caused the fish to die and the water sullied. With that said, the spirit has been angered to the point that she is even willing to wash everyone away to stop the pollution from happening any further. However, Aesir made her realize that if she did such a thing, a lot of innocent people would be affected as well. Those mothers who just nurture their babies, and fathers who work tirelessly for their family. When the spirit finally realizes how grave her punishment to the people is, the town of Garlet is saved from a supposedly big disaster. On the other hand, the blacksmith guild is also working on a solution for the mine. Aside from that, the true cause of the incident was then cleared up to the public, and Irina's team successfully completed their request. The noble lord was also held accountable for the issues with the mine and dismissed from his position and the indigenous tribe's exile was nullified. Three years later, Aesir is still smithing, but this time, instead of working only on nails, he is now allowed to work on weapons and armor. Aside from that, he also happened to meet a boy named Astor who he thought would make a good adventurer. With that keen eye for weapons, Aesir is looking forward to seeing him again one day. Then, ten years have passed. Master Rock Muncher is now getting married, and it seems like Aesir will take over his business from now on. Irina's party, the White Lake, got to the very top as well, now declared as a 7-star ranked team. But despite this success, the team decided to disband to work on their individual endeavors. In addition to that, the very first person Aesir met in this town, Rodner, has now risen through the ranks becoming captain of the guard. And that boy Astor has now developed into a warrior in his own right. So much has happened in the past 10 years, and the life he had lived for 150 years prior doesn't even compete. Now that Aesir's master finally leaves to start his life in the Dwarf Kingdom, the two bid each other the most emotional farewell there is. Although Aesir was supposed to take over the business, he decided to pursue other things and learn new skills like sorcery. Now that he has finally ended his chapter as a blacksmith, he will now start a new journey in the royal capital. At the royal capital of Ludria, Warfiel, Aesir finally arrives. The royal capital is located right in the center of the kingdom of Ludria, so it is pretty obvious that it is a lot busier than Viscourt. In this city, there are a lot of schools of swordsmanship too. Three of the best are termed the Three Disciples. Different styles of swordsmanship are learned in these schools, some of which are the Ludrian Kingdom style, Lodrin Great Sword style, and Grand style. As he starts to contemplate these things, a girl suddenly shows off her sword style, completely shocking Aesir to the core. As a result, he immediately asks the girl to teach him her style, as he is willing to pay tuition and even do the chores for her. Although he doesn't know the name of the style the girl practices, he wants to be the one who wields it. As a result, she wants to take him to her dojo, with the thought that Aesir would surely change his mind when he saw her training place. Yosogiryu's dojo is one of the sword schools in the kingdom that actually ended up getting ruined over time. So the style she was using a while ago isn't something the school has taught her. Instead, it was one of the few things that her father's teachings had left for her. But learning their style may only draw undue attention from the Lodron kingdom. So the king thinks that it would be better for Aesir to leave now. However, it seems like Aesir is very much decided on this one. So Keha, the girl's name as it turns out, doesn't have any choice but to give Acer what he is asking for. As a result, things started getting really busy very quickly. Since Keha's mother is suffering from some chest illness, Acer went on to find medicinal herbs in the forest. Aside from that, Acer also started making connections in the city as much as he could, as he knew it would really come in handy at some point down the line. Now that Acer has so much to do, he doesn't have any time to learn sorcery anymore, but he doesn't complain at all, as his training finally began. As time passes by, Aesir realizes that swordsmanship is just like smithing. One should make adjustments here and there, little by little, until one is done. Half a year later, Kreas dropped by, and let's just say Keha didn't stand a chance on the noble adventurer. At this moment, Kreas tells them that the only thing that would make a great swordsman is to experience the real world. As a result, Keha ended up asking Aesir for a favor to allow her to become an adventurer. 
but before he does, he tells her to wait as he sets an armor she can take on her journey. Aside from that, Aesir is also asking her to use his home in Viscourt as a base of operations. Three years later after Keha left, Aesir has completely renovated Dojo doing his usual practice swings alone. He has also been taking care of Keha's mom and has been living his best peaceful life in this busy city. Every four months, Keha's letter arrives. And based on the story written on the paper, it is safe to say that she is moving higher and higher in her ranks, which makes Aesir quite happy. But what really excites him now is the fact that they are about to see her again after three years. And by that time, Keha would probably be a seven-star high-rank adventurer already. Although that news is something great to hear, Aesir can't deny the fact that Keha's mother is overly excited about it. Ever since they got that letter, she's been making a feast every single day in hopes that her daughter might come by anytime soon. Although her cooking is indeed phenomenal, with this many dishes eating it all feels like torture. However, at the back of Aesir's mind, he can't just possibly let it all go to waste. So as much as he can, he eats it to the very last bite. As a result of this, Aesir desperately hopes Keha comes back even more every time. And to his surprise, it seems like the girl they have been waiting for has now finally come home. As Keha enters the gate, she immediately shows off the swordsmanship skills she was able to learn as an adventurer. And Aesir can't deny the fact that the three years Keha spent in the real world weren't spent in vain. In only three short years, she has blossomed into a beautiful, breathtaking flower. However, it seems like it wasn't just Keha who came home, as she even invited Irina to come. As they sat to have a proper discussion, Irina went on to explain what had been happening to the elves these past few years. According to her, a handful of Ludrian nobles had been capturing and enslaving elves, for bragging rights presumably. Hearing this made Aesir wonder why it was so easy for a man to capture those elves, considering they should have knowledge of basic adventurer skills, like fighting for instance. However, it seems like the common elves who live outside the Great Sea of Trees aren't really accustomed to battle the way Irina and Aesir are. After all, being able to commune with the spirits is one thing, but doing that in combat is something else entirely. So, it is easy to say that it is hardly impossible for humans to capture elves through military force alone. So, in short, these nobles have been raiding elf settlements in their territory with private armies. Since these elven settlements are so insular and closed off, most people probably don't even notice. What's worse is that the captured elves are tortured in many ways possible. And since their senses are disoriented by drugs injected into them, they can't form any connection to the spirits. This fact somehow makes Irina shiver in anger. But as of now, she can't do anything but ask for Aesir's help on the matter. As per Irina's investigation, those responsible for this matter are those important nobles who have the whole eastern region under their domain. So it is safe to say that the kingdom knows what's happening, yet they are still keeping a blind eye to it. Aside from that, owning an elf slave is becoming more popular to the point that elf slavery can already be legal in due time. As a result, simply sneaking in and rescuing the captured elves won't be enough at this point. So in order to ensure elves never have to suffer anything like this again, Aesir and the elves must carve pain into the very kingdom itself. For them to be able to do so, Irina and Aesir plan to ask the other elves in the forest to emigrate, since if they do, monsters will breed out of control, overflow, and spill out of the forest, causing great problems for the kingdom itself. Although this is such a sudden plan, Irina and Aesir think this would be the perfect thing to do now. However, that also means that Aesir will have to bid Keha goodbye as well. After giving each other quite an emotional message, Irina and Aesir then went on their way. After traveling for a good while, Aesir finally made it to the heart of Eastern Lubdria, inside a fertile forest within the Marquis' private army. In total, the preparations for this plan took half a year. After all, arranging the elven emigration and locating all of the enslaved elves is no easy task, so they couldn't possibly do anything rash until everything was all prepared in advance. Although the thought of attacking the nobles' territory did come across Aesir's mind, asking for help from that water spirit, but in the end, he ended up realizing that wouldn't work at all. He even thought of creating a disastrous event. However, he knows to himself that wouldn't solve the problem at all. What he needs to do now is think of a spectacle as grand as possible, yet the actual damage is minimal. As a result, he ended up using the land spirit to let the people in the territory experience something terrifying. Using the tremor as a signal, elven adventurers moved in to rescue their captive brethren, and the elves began a mass emigration out of the forest. The number was around 8,000 elves in total. So in no time, the forest will soon be flooded by monsters, and the country will likely issue a formal apology. Only when that formal apology is carved into history, that elves can be sure no tragedy like this will ever happen again. Irina will be the main point of contact for negotiations. However, it seems like there is still one more problem. If any of the rescued elves were with a child, half-elves could cause problems in the future of the disasters they invite. 
As a result, Aesir even thought of taking care of them just in case. Either way, he knows that he can no longer stay in this country. So he starts to question himself, where should he go next? The chilly radiance of his steel blade helps him put his tempestuous thoughts at ease somewhat. Just for a moment, he somehow allowed himself to stop thinking and slowly swing his sword. After finally deciding to leave Ludria, Aesir starts off his journey on the road once again. After a couple of days, he finally reached the shore. South of the kingdom of Ludria is Pologia, and even further south is where he has finally arrived, the Republic of Velastrica, facing the sea. It is not a very large country, but it is very successful in maritime trade. It is ruled by a parliament of nobles and a sovereign they elect. However, it seems like Pologia and Velastrica people are having a fight over the border, causing Ludria to be the only country Pologia can rely on delivering export goods. That said, Ludria is technically far wealthier than Pologia in many ways. The idea that one may struggle to obtain basic needs didn't cross Aesir's mind in Ludria, but when he got to Pologia, his perspective on life drastically changed. Thankfully, along the way, he was able to meet great people who helped him go through his travels. Making these people his motivation, Aesir finally reached his destination. Now that he is finally in Velestrica, all that Aesir can think of is eating nothing but seafood. After the guards confirmed that he was not a spy, Aesir was then allowed to roam around the town of Sarot, where seafood is definitely good. Immediately, Aesir visits a tavern and instantly orders big platters of food. As soon as he took the first bite, his soul literally left his body for how good the food tasted so much. However, when his long-awaited fish meal is about to arrive, two men start fighting, startling the waitress and causing Aesir's food to go to waste. As a result, Aesir ended up having a fight with one of the men earlier, with an ending of him being called by the tavern owner himself. The two were then scolded for what happened, but eventually, they both ended up getting along so much, with a guy whose name is Dries offering to catch Aesir some fish himself to make up for what happened. With that said, even though Aesir just got to the new town a while ago, he came to know three people already, the waitress, Karina, the fisherman, Dries, and the tavern owner, Grand. With these three, Aesir was able to find himself right in the middle of the going-ons in this town. As the night bites, Aesir rests up in his in-room. As he attends to his bruises brought about by the fight earlier, he can't deny the fact that Dries is just an ordinary fisherman. Although Dries has already told him that he worked in a trading company before, Aesir still reminds himself to be careful as much as possible. If he gets himself hurt like this again, he could actively hinder his smithing and dueling skills. The next day, Aesir then went on to visit Dries on his work, and it looks like everyone is having a large commotion once again. As soon as Aesir steps in, everybody starts to shut up when Aesir starts to fight them off one by one. Since Aesir did Dries yet another favor, the fisherman has no choice but to make it up to Aesir no matter what. For today's meal, aside from big slices of fish, Aesir was also served with a wonderfully textured eight-legged octopus, which somehow wrapped up the day for the young man. Other than that, by asking around at the inn in the market, he was informed of everything he needed to know about what was happening in this town. According to the information he has learned, this town sees merchants coming and going in large ships, and fishermen using smaller ships in the surrounding area, and there was a serious conflict over the usage of the harbor between them. The fishermen and the merchants are each backed by a prominent noble family, the Pastelli family, who have been unifying the fishermen for ages. On the other hand, the Tritrine family controls many different merchant companies, including Lorette Trading Co. The two families are meant to cooperate to develop and grow the town. As the town saw more people coming and going to trade, sales of fish increased. The more fish sold, the more money the fishermen made. However, the relationship between the two families began to crack, brought about by the conflicts regarding the size of the shore. With that being said, Dries is something like a leader among the younger fishermen, so they wanted to lynch him out, and Lorette, the guy Dries has fought with the other day, was probably planning to demoralize the fishermen that way. The problem is now, even if lynching is a pretty horrific act, Aesir can't say anyone is fundamentally evil to their very core. After about four days in town, Lorette went on to send Aesir an apology letter, asking him to come by to have a talk. However, based on what Aesir has heard, Lorette is quite ruthless and is willing to do anything for the sake of turning a profit. So obviously, Aesir ignores it the best way he can. But it seems like Lorette will not stop until he gets what he wants, and as a result, Aesir has no choice but to fight back. After Aesir caught 10 of Lorette's people, the officials started digging for information from them. What made people wonder is there was no good reason for the entire company to be after his head. That is why, after investigating, the officials found out that Lorette had been harassing the fishermen and had been committing a good amount of fraud on their part. Aside from that, Lorette has also somehow let the entire company down when he started talking about the bad things the company has been doing behind the scenes. As a result, the Tritrine family immediately cut Lorette and his team loose, forcing them to face the consequences on their own. 
However, in the end, nothing really changed. Almost as if it all went exactly according to a script. But on the other hand, Aesir continued to enjoy the food and drink at Grand's Tavern. However, good things must end at some point. Aesir then went on to inform Karina that he would be leaving soon, so the tavern would have no more problem accommodating such a squid enthusiast. Before he leaves, Aesir also manages to realize that Karina has been watching him this whole time, so he speculates that she must have a network of spies all over town. He is not sure if Grand has anything to do with this, but Aesir bet Karina set Lorette up to fail. Until then, this town will remain as it is now, ever developing but not changing too much, so Aesir hopes it will wait for his return. Now that his time in the town of Seafood has finally ended, Aesir is on his way to his next destination, which is the land of sorcery, Odine. This town is one of the many small countries that make up the Eastern United League. The region was initially called the Azed Empire, but due to some succession dispute, the region has now been divided into countries and states. These small countries avoid being swallowed up by larger powers through their alliance with each other. Odine was founded as a place to research magic and to train powerful sorcerers who can single-handedly turn the tide of war. With that said, one of Aesir's goal in this country is to learn magic by the end of his trip. Although there is a chance that he might not find someone who can teach him magic, with the letter that he sent Irina, for sure, the adventure elf would get in touch with him somehow. After traveling for a couple of minutes, Aesir finally reached the town of Jampamon, also known as the Stone Titanic, adrift in a sea of gold. Using his license in smithing, Aesir easily got inside the town. As soon as he found the perfect place to stay, a little girl then started touring him inside the inn. After taking a bath, Aesir went on to eat his first dinner of the day, and to his surprise, the food was more than satisfactory. Since he had plans on expanding his name as a smith in this region, he went on to visit one of the country's most known blacksmith guilds. However, it seems like his rank in Ludria doesn't count for as much here, so he has no choice but to improve his design as much as possible. Unsurprisingly, Aesir was able to adjust to the guild's preference, so in the end, he was able to get as many compliments from the blacksmiths in town. The next few days have been busy for Aesir. Upon investigation, the land this United League is on is fertile and his people are pretty wealthy themselves. As he roams around the city, he is guided by Nana, the little girl from the inn. It has already been a week since he got to Jampamon, and it is safe to say that he has been busy working six days a week, and his one day off today is spent trying as many sweets as he can. However, despite all this richness, there is still some dark side to the country as many people might not expect. The Drodian army is invading Northern Zare, and the Azed alliance may end up convening. The Northern Zare is a militaristic, mercenary country, and the Drodians are a nomadic people with a strong cavalry presence. That is why Aesir is now more curious than ever to know every detail about this matter as much as he can, and for him to do just so, he would need to ask the people at the blacksmith guild tomorrow. According to the smiths, the Yazed alliance might end up being convened, but that is still up in the air. All they know for now is that some of the northern countries in the Eastern United League are sending reinforcements to help out Northern Zare. Hearing this made Aesir realize that he might actually have stepped into the middle of a war unintentionally. But instead of worrying that much about it, for now, Aesir focused on working on the spears, polishing them the best way he could. It seems like the next job he got after the spearheads were forging the greatest sword he could manage. After all, price was no object in this region. At this time, he can already forge any kind of sword he wants. The kind of sword he's most familiar with is the single-edged straight sword used by the Yosogiryu school. It seems like wielding the Yosogiryu style focuses his mind entirely. He mostly focuses on the ideal form the sword should be, from its ideal shape, weight, and balance. So obviously, he hasn't forged it just yet. But while he is still searching for it, his heart is ablaze like a furnace. He needs to give form to what he can see in his mind's eye, even if only partly. And the only people who could understand him were his two masters. That and that alone is enough for him. In fact, it may even be more than enough. Everyone else on the planet need only see the results of his method. After all, he knows that it's going to speak for itself once it is finished. Days have passed and it seems like Aesir is already near to reaching his goals. But of course, it is tiring on his part, considering he has been working tirelessly for three weeks straight already. He worked right through his rest days, trying to get that sword to his satisfaction. But the payment was a substantial sum of 10 large gold pieces. Even Nana is worried about him, but Aesir is thankful for it, considering this little girl has been his pillar through all of it. She took good care of him in times of need. Although on their own, these are pretty trivial things but seeing her do her best to support him kept him motivated. That is why Aesir made sure that when he is up for it, he will definitely take her out for more cake. However, despite all of his efforts, he still feels like he can't get as good as his master Rock Muncher, and he also can't get Keha to wield it for him. So as a result, he can't help but feel a little lonely at some point. At the back of his mind, either of those would have been a greater reward than the gold pieces. 
Over the three days, Aesir keeps lazing around until he feels like it is already time to get a move on to make sure he is in Odine when Irina seeks him out. Since the distance from town to town in this region is about three days apart by foot, Aesir has no choice but to travel tirelessly as he can't stand his motion sickness when in a carriage. As he finally got his eyes locked on some good-looking apples, he immediately realized that he was already in Ardeno territory, which is a widely known region for its fruits. While he was there, he was able to take down a large boar which ended up cooked to be his delicious dinner. As a reward for his help, Aesir also asks the residents to show him to a watering hole. While he is having a feast, one of the villagers goes on to reveal that there is a village called Palnor between Ardeno and Folka. They use all the water in the riverbanks to dye cloth and tan hides. As Aesir thinks about it, tanning a hide can easily take several months to do properly, so he can probably afford to wait. With that being said, the next morning, he immediately went to start his journey. When he reached Lake Zier, he rode a boat to travel from Folka to Laurent. Lake Zier is a part of the Zier Republic. The trip from Folka to Laurent takes from morning to evening by boat. Although it may seem a lot, it is actually the quickest way to travel across two of the towns. Despite the fact that he has come a long way to reach Odine, he doesn't regret it at all. Since the experience he was able to have in these cities was for a lifetime, but he can't deny the fact that he is pretty excited to reach Odine, the land of sorcery. A few days later, Aesir finally reached Odine, and by that time, it was already nighttime, so he immediately checked into an inn. There, he is obviously excited to take his first step to becoming a magician, and if you wonder how, let's just say one needs to check their aptitude in a public office. The next morning, he immediately went on to visit one of Odine's most known public offices. For those who don't know, sorcery is the process by which one's internal magic power, aka mana, is converted into energy using a specific technique, such as a spell in order to produce a desired phenomenon. However, if one can't pass the aptitude test, then one can't study sorcery in Odine at all. That is why Aesir is pretty nervous about this test, as it will initiate his first step into reaching his goal. Although it is already a little late to be saying this, he is confident in doing this because of his sheer optimistic aspiration. But deep inside, he is actually nervous to the core. When it is already his time to take the test, the nervousness in his eyes is so apparent. But Aesir has no choice but to do this, considering the fact that there are plenty of magical things to be found in this world. But the only thing he can learn is sorcery. As he sat down on the chair, the confusion in the examiner's eyes was so clear, causing Aesir to ask what was wrong with the look. Immediately, the examiner apologizes, explaining that he has never seen an elf taking the aptitude test before, though he has seen dwarves a number of times already. This statement caused Aesir to feel off a little since it is known that dwarves have come to take the aptitude test dozens of times with the aim of creating magic equipment. Although dwarves are supposed to be Aesir's enemy as they are his ancestor's rival, Aesir can't help but hide the happiness in his eyes when he realizes that dwarves have gotten interested in learning magic so that they can enchant their smithing works. However, among all the hundreds that have tried to take the test, only two ever passed, and both are already long gone. So to start the test, the examiner shows Aesir all of the equipment they will use throughout the process. As he holds two of the rods close to one another, a magical beam of light then suddenly appears, indicating that he passed the aptitude test. With that said, since his intent is to learn sorcery, the examiner then went on to explain to him his various options. First is the Sorcery Military Academy. There he can learn sorcery and its applications for warfare. Unfortunately, one needs to have an Eastern United League citizenship to qualify to enroll in the said academy. The second is the Adventurer's Academy. There, one can learn how to fight monsters and use sorcery for self-defense. However, if he were to enroll in the said academy, he would need to operate within the United League for three years straight. The third one is the Academy of Foundational Sorcery. As the name implies, it focuses primarily on basic foundational magic. And last but not least, one can learn under a magician, which is something perfect for Aesir's case. But the examiner did remind him that he might get in trouble as he learned sorcery. So if he happens to have faced one, the examiner asks him to contact them anytime. With that said, after a week, Aesir started approaching as many sorcerers as he could, hoping to be taken on as an apprentice. However, it seems like every single one of them regarded him with hostility and turned him down. With his motivation waning, he started pouring his energy into working for the blacksmith guild in the said city. In the said guild, it seems like Aesir has found himself an apprentice. Koshman Fiedel is a magician with an atelier who eagerly wants to forge himself a magic sword. And for him to be able to do just that thing, he needs to find the perfect teacher to teach him the good way of smithing. Aesir found out that Koshman was an apprentice himself until a few years ago. His master was the magician Rajdol, a dwarven magician who is known to be very rare in Odine. Rajdol has his own atelier in town where he crafts his tools. 
Seeing his master do great both in magic and in smithing, Koshman ended up getting interested in working on it as well. But then, a few years ago, Rajdol suddenly left the town to return to the Dwarven Kingdom, and Koshman was left to grow by himself. As of now, he can only use ready-made tools while researching magic equipment, but he doesn't know a thing about smithing, which is where Aesir enters the scene. After seeing Aesir do such a great job forging equipment, Koshman just immediately knew that Aesir was the perfect master he was looking for. Although he couldn't believe an elf like Aesir would be so good at this craft, he just knew that Aesir was definitely the one he wanted to teach him everything. So right now, Koshman is deeply begging for Aesir's approval to become his master. As Aesir reflects on his own request to be taken on as a pupil, he goes on to agree to teach Koshman about smithing, as long as Koshman teaches him sorcery in exchange, making this deal a win-win situation for both parties. At the back of Aesir's mind, meeting Koshman like this could only have been the work of fate. But if he is being honest, he's kind of annoyed it was Koshman and not him who brought it about. Anyway, right after their deal, they immediately went to Koshman's atelier. As soon as Aesir stepped in, he immediately felt this nostalgic feeling, as the place felt just like his master Rock Mantra's forging shop. For them to immediately start their lessons, Koshman went on to start the furnace right away. To start off, since they are going to make a magic sword eventually, Aesir decides to teach Koshman how to make a regular sword first. The clanging sounds somehow give Koshman the sense of comfort, as the aura of his then master somehow is coming back. Aesir is a blacksmith, and Koshman is a sorcerer. They are both birds that can't fly with their single wing, but by working together, they can fly towards their goal of crafting a magic sword. And by the time they no longer need each other for that purpose, Aesir will gladly be able to call Koshman a friend. The next morning, they then started their sorcery lessons. Koshman teaches Aesir how to control his inner mana first, and to Koshman's surprise, it seems like Aesir is quite the talented one for being able to learn it right away. With that said, they then moved on to learning the techniques. According to Koshman, everything that influences one's mana is a piece of the formula. A series of actions such as speech, intent, and patterns can greatly make sorcery possible. That is why, for Aesir to be good at using magic, he first needs to learn how these formulas affect mana. At first, Aesir started to feel guilty, considering he already knew how to talk with spirits, which many magicians can't. So for him, learning sorcery just feels like cheating. But then, Koshman made him realize that there's no such thing as cheating. If Aesir gave the will and the aptitude to learn sorcery, he would have as much right as anyone. And just like that, the two begin alternating teaching and learning sorcery and smithing every day. As the day passed by, it seemed like the two started to get along so well, causing another great friendship to blossom. It has already been months since Aesir first got to Odin. One day, he happened to receive a letter from Irina, updating him about the happening in Ledrian at the moment. It seems like no formal apology was issued to the elves, which was something Aesir was already expecting. However, he doesn't worry at all, since in about 3-5 to five years, Ludria's forest will already be overflowing with monsters. On the other hand, it seems like Aesir still has other concerns to take care of. As it turns out, there is but one elf carrying a child of man. Since there is still no possible way of knowing if the child can commune with the spirits, Aesir is temporarily asked to take care of the child for now. Just thinking about it makes Aesir tired already. However, since he already promised to do so back then, he has no choice but to fulfill what he needs to do. Since he still doesn't know if it is a boy or a girl, Aesir already started thinking of activities he can do with the child when it arrives. He also promised to make sure to take care of the child the best way he can and become its guardian and closest companion. Fast forward, a year has already passed in Odine, and it seems like Aesir and Koshman are still training non-stop. Since they have already learned the basics of both sorcery and smithing from one another, the two are now starting to discuss more about magic tools. For their first official project, the two decided to make their own short metal wand. In year 3, there have already been a couple of developments with Aesir's sorcery skills. On the other hand, the Drodian army has been invading Northern Zaire, so the kingdom has been requesting for backup from the Azed Alliance. Students from Odin's Sorcery Academy were sent, and one of those students brought one of Aesir and Koshman's wands to battle. Surprisingly, it ended up saving a lot of lives. As a result, their little barrier wand got a lot of attention all at once. Since the wand's work was constant, the army has now fully integrated it into their official weapons. Meanwhile, it seems like Koshman is also working on some research, and as long as he doesn't finish it just yet, they will not start working on their magic sword just yet. Aside from that, it turns out that two years from now, Aesir is left to take charge of the half-elf, but he is sure by that point, Koshman and he will already be done teaching each other their respective skills. Thus, in simple words, in two years, they both intend to leave this nest each with a co-created magic sword in hand. So, for them to reach that point, it is going to take every bit of their collective ability. In year 4, after countless prototypes, they finally made their very own magic sword. 
Somehow seeing the sword get used makes Aesir quite emotional, as it is something he has been looking forward to for years. In year 5, Aesir will now begin taking his offensive arts exam. Although Aesir doesn't care about ranks or honors, he still wants to get his hands on that sorcerer certification. And as expected, Aesir did well once again. It has already been 5 years since he began learning magic, and Aesir's magic sword has now been finished. With that said, it is now about time for Koshman and him to start their separate journey on different roads. As Aesir reminisces about his time with Koshman, he starts to get emotional all of a sudden. Koshman is both his partner in crime and rival, almost. But the roads they were taking diverged at this point, just like how their magic swords couldn't be more different. With that said, Aesir is hoping to see Koshman once again in the future, with the intent to show him a brand new magic sword he crafted by then. When Aesir finally reached the capital of Zanes, he went on to stay in Swege Inn, where he and Irina planned on meeting. As soon as Irina got in, he went on to inform Aesir about everything that was happening at the Ludrian Kingdom right now. Following the whole affair, many people in the eastern region have immigrated away, fearful of the calamity that might happen. As a result, the country's harvests have seen a depression as a result of the east's downturn in population. Aside from that, it seems like Aesir's plan has been going well since the royal family now has been taking action before it is too late for them to rebuild their empire back from the ground. Since Aesir knows for a fact that Irina would be able to take care of this matter herself, their discussion about the kingdom has aborted for a bit. Immediately, Aesir went on to ask Irina where the child he was supposed to take care of is. But since the child is still taking a midday nap, Aesir has no choice but to control his excitement for a bit. Seeing the looks in Aesir's eyes, Irina knows that he genuinely would want the best for the child, but Irina reminds him that taking this child in might only lead to heartache. This statement made Aesir wonder if Irina happens to be concerned for his sake, or if she is simply projecting her anxieties onto him. So he went on to assure her that he was doing this because he wanted to, and if she is worried about what might happen in the end, there's no need to fear at all, considering Aesir knows himself that he would not retreat to the ward because of fear. These kind words somehow struck Irina so much, and when the spirits went on to send the signal that the child had already woken up, Aesir immediately went on to visit it in its room. As soon as he opens the door, Aesir somehow can't manage to be dazzled by the child's cuteness. Upon checking, it seems like the child is actually a boy. As Aesir leans closer, it seems like the child himself is also dazzled by how shiny Aesir is. As the child pinches his cheeks, Aesir can't help but smile so widely. Although for many this probably looks incredibly bizarre, but he knows that he is enjoying every moment of it. After that brief cuteness overload moment, Aesir happens to remember that this child has not been named yet, so Aesir ends up naming him Wynn. Now that they have finally introduced themselves to each other, Aesir's heart is so happy, considering the fact that he will have the chance to take care of such a cute child like Wynn. However, after a couple of minutes, it seems like Aesir is clueless about what to do next. But along the way, it seems like Aesir was able to still manage to do it correctly. When he goes out to shop for some goods, he also brings Wynn with him. Even Nana herself is quite in love with Wynn's cuteness. But as it turns out, it seems like Aesir is actually planning on asking Nana to take care of Wynn while he works as he finally decided to stay in town for one or two years. He did promise to pay Nana plenty for her job. Without hesitation, Nana went on to agree to Aesir's request. And just like that, it seems like Wynn has found himself a new friend to play with. On the other hand, it seems like Aesir did this so that Wynn would be able to adjust to new things and environments. With that taken care of, Aesir then tells the two that they were now about to eat macaroni gratin, one of Aesir's favorites. As they sat down around the dining table, Nana started to ask some questions if elves liked apples so much, since if they did, she planned on cooking more food with it so that the inn would have more elf customers. However, it seems like Nana asks the wrong elf, considering Aesir literally loves all kinds of food there is. While watching Wynn eat, Aesir starts to tell himself that once Wynn is a little bit older, he would like to take him on a food tour across the land. And Aesir hopes Wynn likes traveling half as much as he does, as he wants to see all kinds of places with this cute child. Compared to him, Aesir knows that Wynn doesn't have very much time to do that himself. While they peacefully eat their lunch, a man then says hi to Aesir. As soon as Aesir saw the man's face, he immediately recognized it as someone from the Blacksmith Guild. Since he only worked for them for a couple of weeks six years ago, Aesir didn't think that someone from the guild would be happy to see him at all. As he thinks of it, he then suddenly realizes that he should have asked the man if he has some work Aesir can take care of. Considering he already decided to keep Wynn company for a bit, Aesir plans to check with the guild eventually later on the day. After a month of taking it easy, Aesir finally has a couple of jobs to do already. Aside from that, it seems like Aesir has also become so popular among blacksmiths that many have already been lining up to ask him to take them as his apprentice. 
Knowing that Aesir is now a busy person, some of his workmates went on to assure these people not to bother Aesir directly as much as possible. But above all, it seems like Aesir has been asked to have an audience with the King of Trivia. Anyhow, it seems like everyone in the guild is honored to work with someone like Aesir, as this is something not all people can have. With that said, at the back of Aesir's mind, time has indeed passed by so easily. But being back here again just feels like home for Aesir. On the other hand, while Aesir is busy working, Nana is making sure to take care of Wynn the best way she can. As much as possible, she keeps on encouraging Wynn to play with kids her own age, as it is an important part of growing up. However, it seems like Wynn is just out of the ordinary, making it hard for him to make friends. That is why, as much as possible, whenever Aesir has a day off, he always takes Wynn hiking and teaches him a thing or three. Since Wynn is a little too young to be taught how to fight or commune with spirits, Aesir just makes sure the little boy learns how to be strong inside. Upon observing, Aesir can tell that Wynn is the type of child who responds very well to being given things and is even prone to developing heavy attachments. But it seems like he is not good at asking for things of his own volition. That's exactly why Aesir wants Wynn to learn spirit communing properly, even at such a young age. But aside from that, Aesir has also been teaching Wynn how to think on his own. Although Wynn looks like a four-year-old, he is actually already seven, so it is a must that he knows how to make decisions himself. Aside from that, with Nana and Aesir looking after him, Wynn is simply motivated to learn. One year later, it seems like Aesir is worried at the fact that the humans that are around Wynn's age will now soon outpace his growth, considering he is a half-elf. But that is something they will have to deal with sooner or later regardless. A year and a half later, a letter from Irina arrived saying that Aesir and Wynn are good to enter Ludria now. Aesir does everything to persuade Wynn, but it seems like the child has built such an unbreakable attachment with Nana that he can't let her go anymore. So Aesir asks Wynn to make Nana a gift. Although Nana wanted to bid Wynn goodbye with a smile, after seeing the gift, she started crying her eyes out, causing Wynn to insist on staying. But since they can't do so, Aesir has no choice but to drag him out of the city, with Wynn still crying as Ludria is now waiting for the return. After traveling for a few days, Wynn and Aesir finally reach the royal capital of Ludria, Orfiel. It seems like Aesir decided to avoid the eastern region of the country when he and Wynn traveled to the kingdom, considering that was the place where he caused an earthquake. But even here, he is still getting countless stares. But even here, he is still getting countless stares. As he passed down one store, a vendor then called his attention. It seems like the old man is shocked to see that Aesir is already back. As Aesir thinks more deeply about it, he finally remembers who this person is. After catching up for a bit, Wynn and Aesir finally decided to visit Yosogiryu Dungeon to see Keha. When they got in, the new students of the dojo started telling them that they were not allowed to enter at all. However, when these pupils finally realize that Aesir is no outsider, as he is the prodigal disciple who repaired the dojo, these students immediately gave Aesir his due respect. Then suddenly, Keha finally enters the scene, looking so strong and mature. It seems like Keha didn't expect Aesir to get back this soon. So Aesir went on to jokingly say that he thought it would be better to be a decade early than a decade late. After a while, Keha finally noticed Wynn, so Aesir went on to introduce the two to each other. Aesir informs his then swordmaster that Wynn is his adopted son, and whom he has been taking good care of these past few years. Knowing Aesir to be someone with a good heart, Keha immediately smiled at that fact. On the other hand, it seems like Keha has some kids to take care of herself. As a result, she went on to tell Mizuha and Shizuki to think of Wynn as a younger brother, and let's just say the three get along so well. Some weeks later, it seems like Aesir has been spending his time forging blades for Keha and playing with Wynn and the two kids nonstop. But it looks like his attempt at being considerate to the other disciples has backfired somewhat. Apparently, Keha's poor mood is starting to frighten the other disciples. That is why, to lift Keha's mood, Aesir finally shows off his swordsmanship form to everyone. But it seems like Keha wants Aesir not to use a wooden sword. Instead, he will need to use the sword he keeps at his side, the magic blade Aesir created with Koshman. In all honesty, Aesir hasn't mastered using it 100%. But since this is what Keha wants, Aesir went on to do as he was ordered to. Although his form has undeniably improved since the last time Keha saw it, Keha still didn't want to sugarcoat things as she goes on to state that Aesir's form is not fit for combat at all. It is as though she is looking at her own blade from so long ago. Or perhaps, it is as though Aesir's sword is not wielded with the intent to grow stronger at all. So, Keha went on to emphasize that if he wants to improve, he needs to start having prospects of honing his blade any further. On top of that, ensure that her words are engraved in Aesir's mind. She went on to continue, stating that for her, Aesir still lacks the drive to engage in battle. In short, he still doesn't have a great fighting spirit. That is why he needs to practice more 
to gain more. Some weeks later, at the northern part of the Ludria Kingdom, near the border to the Fortal Empire, Aesir is seen guarding the border, as he promised to Irina that he will be protecting Ludria from any invasion by the Fortal Empire. Although Ludria has done a lot of dirty things to the elves, Aesir and the others can't possibly let the kingdom fall, considering all of the hard work they put into the elven Ludria negotiations will go to waste if another country takes over. To be perfectly blunt, it is far more convenient for elves as a whole to have humans who know not to mess with them as neighbors, as opposed to ones who see them as a strange novelty. And it is safe to say that Ludria would indeed owe the elves big after this. When Aesir reached the top of the mountain, he was shocked to see how wide the man-made path the kingdom had made. However, since it doesn't work so much for Aesir, he goes on to do a little work on it using his land-shaking powers. It seems like Aesir went on to lift some of the land so that the next generation could build a new road in the future. At the back of Aesir's mind, if he wasn't so critically deficient in fighting spirits, maybe he might have run in and taken the fight to the Empire himself. But as he thinks more about it, he just doesn't think he is cut out for that. Aesir then went on to contemplate that the beauty of Chaos Blade enamors him, and he now wants to wield it as she does. Despite the fact that he is halfway to reaching that goal, he is still eager to become the student Keha would be proud of. However, Aesir is well aware that he doesn't have any motivation to become stronger at all. Although it might sound a bit arrogant, he knows to himself that he is already strong enough as is. So, as things are, he is fine with a wanting swordsman that just likes swords, but it is still possible that he will change his mind someday. However, it sounds like Keha wouldn't have the chance to see Aesir mature to become the best swordsman there is. One year later, Aesir is working on a sword to enter the fair this year, which is something they will present to the king. But it seems like Aesir can't concentrate with Keha's face flitting in and out of his mind. As a result, he suddenly decided to go on a trip to Viscourt with Wynn. But before they can leave, it seems like Shizuki also wants to come along. Despite Aesir's concerns, Shizuki somehow managed to get permission to leave. Wynn is very attached to both Shizuki and Mizaha, so traveling together won't be a problem at all. After walking for a couple of days, they have finally reached their destination. As the gates to Viscourt's open, Aesir started to reminisce about the time he first walked through those same gates with Irina, Martina, and Kreis of the White Lake. In this same town, he was able to meet his first master, so being able to step on this land after 15 years is somewhat emotional for Aesir. As they walk around the city, Aesir is able to come across Rodner, the first guard he ever met. After catching up a little, Aesir and the two boys then went on to visit Kreis and Martina's estate. After settling inside as Martina insisted, Kreis returned shortly thereafter. His eyes passed over Wynn and Aesir, but when they settled on Shizuki, his demeanor became somewhat strained. So Aesir speculated that maybe Kreis is Shizuki and Mizuha's father. However, that wouldn't add up, considering Kreis was already married when he and Keha met, and Aesir is sure enough that Keha is never the type who would homewreck a family. Now that his curiosity has gotten deeper, Aesir just brushed it off for now, since it is not technically his problem to dwell on. He just tells himself that for sure, Keha loves both her kids with everything she has, just like how Aesir loves Wynn despite him not being his biological child. In the end, no matter what he does or does not know, he will be here for these kids no matter what. The next day, it seems like Shizuki went on to ask Kreis for a duel. At this point, Aesir finally realizes that this might be Shizuki's goal in coming to Viscourt this whole time. As the two fight in the backyard, Aesir notices that Kreis' blade work has come to emphasize skill, more than sheer power. Meanwhile, Shizuki's skill is not that well developed just yet. Shizuki may not be consciously aware of it, but Aesir thinks that the child is trying to get closer to his probable father via swordplay. But stepping back, including Shizuki, Aesir doesn't feel that anyone has been acting with malice or bad faith. And in that case, Aesir finally tells himself that he is not inclined to worry too much, since he knows that if anyone needs him, all they have to do is ask. As Aesir keeps on getting a bit emotional with his thoughts, Shizuki and Kreis continue their duel till the end of the day. About one month later, the moment they return to the capital, Mizuha came down to Aesir like a ton of bricks. It seems like she got so emotional at the fact that Aesir only brought Shizuki with them, not even inviting her to come as well. But knowing that she will feel okay one day, Keha tells Aesir not to worry at all. With that being said, now that he is back in the capital, he then immediately starts finishing forging the sword he is about to submit to the show. After working non-stop for hours, Aesir finally went on to decide to have a short break with the kids. It seems like they are out and about once again. While they are out, Aesir realizes that as a child of the dojo master, both Mizuha and Shizuki are very disciplined and rarely self-indulgent. But at the back of Aesir's mind, even then, they are still both just children. Even with all the love and affection their mother and grandmother give them, Aesir can tell that there is still a desire for some kind of paternal figure, 
That is why Shizuki was so dogged in his challenge to Kreis. Mizuha, meanwhile, simply has a somewhat spoiled side, which Aesir thinks is manifesting from a desire for acknowledgement, which to be honest, Aesir finds so cute. After walking for a good hour or two, they finally reach their destination, a huge magical tree. It is said that this tree is sacred and one can only perceive it while in the presence of those who can see the spirits. This is technically where Aesir wants to take the kids. After sightseeing this majestic tree, as the night bites, the three then sat down to eat dinner in the forest. There, Mizaha thanks Aesir for bringing her with him today. Then out of nowhere, Mizaha went on to ask if she would make a good adventurer. But knowing that Mizaha is still young to think of these things, Aesir just went on to reply to her in a joking way. But hypothetically, if Mizaha does end up adventuring, Aesir would be willing to set her up with weapons and armor, just like he did with Keha in the past. Fast forward, it has already been 8 years since Aesir returned to Dojo. When the twins reach the age of 15, Aesir decides to gift them with a magic sword. Wynn, however, has visually grown less than half of how much they have grown, which is hard on his part, but is something that they need to accept eventually. On a side note, it seems like Keha's mom's death is already at hand, which is why the old lady went on to have a talk with Aesir alone. The old lady revealed everything she knew about Keha and the children. Despite the fact that Aesir has been such a blessing and joy to their family, the old lady can't deny the fact that he was somewhat also a curse to Keha. After he left, Keha started seeking ways to make him proud when he came back. She didn't intend to have children, but since she promised to pass down her skills to her children, Keha ended up convincing Kreis and his wife to allow her to conceive Kreis' children. Although it indeed confused the hell out of Aesir at some point, in the end he was able to realize that both parties had reasons why they ended up with such decisions. In the end, Keha still becomes the best mother for the twins, and there's no denying that. Aside from that, the old lady also wants Aesir to realize that her daughter's love for him will never fade, no matter what. Five days later, Keha's mother finally took her leave from this world. In spite of the loss of a loved one, there was little change in their day-to-day -day lives. Soon enough, that loss had simply become part of the past. Two years later, Master Rock Muncher sent Aesir a letter, asking if Aesir is willing to take the offer of becoming his assistant as he needs one right now. Immediately, Aesir accepted the offer. After all, this is something he was hoping to do for the last few years. However, it seems like Wynne wouldn't allow him to go without him. So Aesir has no choice but to take his kid to the Dwarven Kingdom. The two prepared for three months, and when it was finally time to leave, Aesir and Keha had yet another emotional farewell. However, this time around, Aesir wants Keha to promise to spend her final days by Aesir's side when he comes back. Seeing the look on her face makes Aesir quite happy, although she is much older than when they first met. But for Aesir, she is still as beautiful as ever. After a few days, they finally reach the northern part of the Ludria Kingdom, near the Dwarven Country. Now together with a Dwarven guide, Aesir does his best to ensure that he and Wynne get to the Dwarf Kingdom no matter what. That is why, despite the cold, he keeps on moving forward. Until one day, all they need to cross is one more mountain, and they will finally reach their destination. It is known that neither elves or humans should be allowed to enter the Dwarven Country, but exceptions could be made if one has received an invitation from a Dwarf with enough influence. The Dwarven Country is in a great big cavern. According to the guide, tens of thousands of Dwarves live here, so it is safe to say it is such a big country. When they finally reached the gates, lots of dwarves started shouting at Aesir, considering elves had not been allowed to enter the area since the beginning of time. As a result, Aesir shouted back, stating that he was summoned by his master. So if anyone had a problem with that, then they might have to make him leap by force. As the dwarf starts to prepare his fists, Aesir does as well. And surprisingly, it seems like Aesir has managed to take him down in one go. However, it seems like Aesir hasn't realized he is literally in the dwarven country where everyone is known to be the strongest when it comes to fistfights like this. As a result, in the end, he ended up getting more bruises than expected. Thankfully, his master got to pick him up himself. As soon as they got to the master's residence, Aesir was immediately flooded with scolding. But in the end, the two ended up laughing at each other. On the other hand, it seems like Wynn is having a discussion with the other dwarves himself. The others thought he was a girl, considering he didn't have a single hair on his face. And just like Aesir, it seems like little Wynn has also been inviting trouble himself. Aesir somehow finds it cute seeing Wynne getting into his very first fistfight, and it seems like his master Asvold raised his kids without giving them any biases against elves as well. Now that the fun is finally over, Aesir and his master then went to get down to brass tacks. So to summarize what they have discussed, it seems like Aesir's master is competing with a great number of skilled craftsmen, but one dwarf now stands ahead of the pack, namely one Rajudol, the very same man who acted as the sorcery master for Koshman, who is Aesir's own sorcery master slash smithing pupil. 
However, for Asvald, Rajudol is technically not a master smith at all, as he has been able to process Mithril himself. Mithril is the single most prized precious metal among dwarves and the symbol of their king. Processing one requires an insane amount of heat, which is why the country has a specialized forge for that exact purpose. And that forge is said to be a hidden treasure, reserved exclusively for the king himself. However, it seems like Aesir knows exactly how Rajadol is doing all this, considering Rajadol is a dwarf who specializes in sorcery on the side. With this information, Asvold finally realizes what is going on. However, he made it a goal to ensure that Rajadol doesn't become the next king, considering a lot of dwarves who can't use sorcery might fall down if the kingdom started forging nothing but magical tools. Aside from that, Asvold also wants to fulfill his promise to Aesir, that once he becomes king, he will make sure to allow elves to enter the kingdom anytime they want. Meanwhile, at the back of Aesir's mind, if Koshman is here, he will surely be eager to watch his master getting into a showdown with Aesir's master, with Koshman surely saying that his master will win for sure. But on a serious note, Aesir is sure of the fact that Rajadol might have been working towards taking the throne for decades already. After all, he has been studying magic tools with Koshman for that purpose, and left his gifted apprentice to his own devices to finally put their research to use. So Aesir informs his master that Rajadol is indeed someone who is not easy to beat at all, which Asvald is quite aware of, hence why he called Aesir for help in the first place. As of now, Asvald sees they have two things to work on. One is to build a fire hot, and the second is a furnace that they can handle. But since they need to wait for the materials to gather and the construction to finish up, Aesir plans to work on carving out a comfortable niche for him and win in the Dwarven country. After doing all the normal things in the kingdom, one day, one of the elves who turned out to be one whom Aesir got into a fight with when he first arrived, went on to take him to a place where the apprentice is trained. As soon as Aesir entered the room, everyone became silent, with a judging look painted on their face. But as time passed by, it seemed like all of them just got along pretty well. This time around, it seems like Aesir is planning to forge something for Wynn, whom he has already trained back in Chaos Dojo. As he works on it, every dwarf's gaze is locked on him. However, instead of getting intimidated, Aesir becomes motivated instead, considering this a way he can show everyone what his master has taught him over the years. About a year later, the two have already settled into the Dwarven country pretty well. Although Aesir was kicked out of the apprentice training area, considering his skills are not for an apprentice level anymore, but the dwarves that he met there ultimately recognized his ability as a blacksmith. On the other hand, it seems like Wynn is also doing good himself as he started attending school. Although there are some dwarves who don't want to be friends with him, Wynn still manages to build connections with many of his classmates in school. By the looks of it, it seems like Wynn is tackling these challenges head on like a grown up little man. Meanwhile, it seems like the furnace Asvald and Aesir are waiting for is already ready as well, which means they are now set for the main event. A few days later, after spending some quality time with Wynn, Asvold and Aesir started spending their days coaxing a spirit to move into their new furnace. It wasn't really a problem, since the spirit from Asvald's old forge seemed to still be very fond of him, so getting it to change residence wasn't too hard. Aside from that, it seems like Asvald also wants them to start using Mithril themselves. However, since Asvald is still not king, he is forbidden to teach Aesir how it works, so they are just going to refine it for now. And just like that, they started working once again. Things have progressed from there pretty much how they would expect it to be. Five years later, Asvald and Aesir started working through a number of ideas they had in mind. Aside from that, it seems like Wynn has also grown drastically himself. The once little kid has now grown interested in smithing himself and is now officially Asvald's apprentice. Then suddenly, they got disturbing news. It seems like the Empire of Fodol is readying an invasion of Ludria, shocking Aesir considering he already blocked the road between the two when he lifted that mountain a few years back. However, since the news was indeed confirmed by the Dwarven Caravan, Aesir has no choice but to leave Wynn for a year in the Dwarven Kingdom while he checks up on others back in Ludria. Before heading to Fodol, Aesir together with a couple of dwarves was able to cross the infamous Draco's Peak, which according to legend has a dragon nest inside it. As Aesir tries to remember it, dragon's existence was actually mentioned in elf stories as well. According to some poems he has heard before, dragons are actually among the five immortal beings to have lived in this world. It is said that these creatures would not be awakened from their sleep until the end of the world is already near. So when Aesir was asked if he believes in such creatures, he went on to jokingly state that he has no plans on seeing one now since that would be quite a problem. The dwarves then laughed a little at Aesir's sudden unpredicted answer, and they went on to continue with their journey to Fodol. During the whole course of this mission, Aesir plans to investigate the Fodol Kingdom's alleged plans to save Ludria. Since Aesir is not sure if the dwarves who reported to him were stating reliable information, he has no choice but to check it for himself. And if the information he received is actually true, he also plans to figure out how Fodol plans to invade the country. A 
Aside from that, he is also curious to know if Ford will happen to have a discussion, seeking help from a high elf in moving the debris he has put in the middle of the path across the mountains, considering there is no way a normal elf would be able to commune with the spirits of that level. With that being said, three weeks later, Aesir and the others have finally arrived at Koltoria, a buzzing town in the Fordal Empire. But instead of coming in all at once, the dwarves decided to enter the city first so that they could find a safe place where Aesir could stay for the rest of the trip. Since dwarves are kind of neutral among empires, it is safe to say that they are the best comrades one can have in such a dreadful investigation mission. After receiving the signal, Aesir immediately went on to fetch the note that the dwarves left for him, since there was no way possible he could stay in the inn where the others were staying. As much as possible, Aesir tries his best to keep a low profile to avoid causing trouble to the dwarves who have already done more than enough for him. But as soon as he got to the place the dwarves had prepared for him, he started getting emotional at how well prepared everything for him was. As a result, he now has no choice but to do his best to ensure that the dwarves' sacrifices for him would not go to waste. That is why, as soon as he woke up the next day, he immediately went on to start investigating. His continued eavesdropping and non-stop talking lasted for about three weeks. After conferring with the dwarves, Aesir can now confirm that the Empire was indeed definitely preparing for war. With all the war supplies they ordered, it would be bizarre if they weren't going to invade Ludria. But the question now is, how will the Empire's army cross the mountains? Well, based on what Aesir knows, a man whose name is Lei Hong happens to have an idea of how. So immediately, Aesir went on to look into this Lei Hong guy. It seems like Lei Hong has got the Emperor's liking. So even if the others would want to oppose his suggestion on invading Ludria, they have no choice but to agree to it, since the Emperor would agree with Lei Hong nonetheless. Even the Emperor's then most trusted right-hand man was branded as a traitor for questioning Lei Hong's full authority for the invasion. But what's weird is the fact that there have been rumors stating that Lei Hong devours the slaves he buys. Since the time for their meeting had finally ended, Aesir went on to contemplate whether Lei Hong happened to practice cannibalism. But since he has no proof to prove this feeling, he just went on to continue with his investigation to gather more information. After a few days, the dwarves then went on to inform him that the other dwarves who were supposed to meet them in town had gone missing after having a surprise audience with the Emperor. What's weird is the fact that no one has seen the group of nine dwarves leave the Emperor's room at all. As a result, Aesir went on to continue with his investigation even more, and he was surprised with what he found out. It seems like his hunch regarding Lei Hong was horribly correct. Based on his investigation, Lei Hong came to the Emperor and offered to restore the leader's youth. That is why he has been killing slaves and non-humans in ritualistic sacrifices. So, as Aesir takes a closer look at it, he finally ends up realizing that Lei Hong is actually a hermit who draws the power of nature into themselves and commands it in a sort of hermetic wizardry. Hermits happen to have three kinds. The ones who practice the heretical arts are called shamans, while those who gather life force through pleasures are known as incubi or succubi. Last but not least, the vampires, who are beings that gather energy by consuming flesh and blood. These creatures are known as strong beings, so moving the block in the path through the mountains wouldn't be a problem for them at all. That is why Aesir will not anymore hesitate to get rid of Lei Hong, since the lives of his loved ones in Ludria are now in line if he doesn't do anything as soon as possible. So to start off with this plan, Aesir decided to visit the Imperial capital, since Lei Hong is said to have been stuck there due to the snow, and it seems like the dwarves have insisted on coming with him as well. Two weeks later, at Dagria in the capital, with a map that the dwarves have handed him as well as his senses, Aesir easily found Lei Hong's mansion, and to his surprise, it is as massive as a royal castle. However, what's weird is, Aesir doesn't sense a single servant inside. As soon as he arrived, he immediately went on to the exact place where Lei Hong's dark presence was prominent. Just as he opened the window, he immediately started attacking him with his arrows. However, to his surprise, none of his shots even landed a hit on the guy. At this point, he finally realizes that Lei Hong is indeed a monster inside. So with much effort, he tries his best to blast the guy with compressed air. But even that doesn't land a scratch at Lei Hong at all. As their fight intensifies, Aesir starts to look at himself as pathetic, for not thinking that Lei Hong is a vampire. So this guy can basically command nature itself with his hermetic arts. That is why, Lei Hong can nullify whatever power communing with the spirits that is lending Aesir. That is why, Aesir can't help but regard himself as weak, considering Lei Hong's strengths are indeed on the next level compared to him. Knowing the fact that the power the spirits had lent him is fearsome, but the fact that Lei Hong can sweepily revert them is just phenomenal. So Aesir started thinking if he just tried to leverage brute force, then he would surely have a chance. But at this point, there is a big chance that he will never be able to beat Lei Hong at all. However, as he remembered the fact that he was doing all of this for his loved ones, Aesir had no choice but to have courage and continue to fight. Using the magic he learned from Kashman, the will and technique he got from Keha, and the magic sword he wielded with his own hands, 
Aesir ended up completely defeating the monster in the end. As soon as he was already sure that Lei Hong was finally dead, he immediately headed back to where the dwarves were staying to avoid getting suspected by the guards. It took him around 10 days to recover, and during that time, the investigation into Lei Hong's death had already been ongoing. Since none of the nobles even cared about Lei Hong's death, it was not long before the emperor started crumbling to pieces. Now that Lei Hong is already gone, he doesn't have a source of energy anymore, causing his illness to get even more severe than before. The prince has also stepped in to handle the empire. As soon as he was crowned as the new emperor, he went on to apologize to the dwarves for what happened to their nine comrades. Aside from that, the transformation of the king into a ghoul was also kept a secret from the public since it would definitely cause so much panic among the people. But above all, the most important thing now is that the war has been averted. As a result, Aesir now plans to head back to the dwarves' kingdom, but he is still looking forward to coming back to Fodol. But the next time he comes to visit, he wants to walk through the gates in broad daylight and not skulk around in the dark. According to Genesis, the creator has made four beings that would make the world. First is the High Elves, which can talk to the High Spirits. Then there's the True Titan, high above the clouds. Then, to link the two, the True Phoenix soaring between heaven and earth. Lastly, to act as the world's protector, the True Dragon, sleeping within a mountain. After that, the other beings like dwarves, elves, humans, and beastkin. However, as the world flourished, the gods began to quarrel. It seems like they have favored and prioritized different races. The conflict brought into being mana, and mana's introduction to the world brought about monsters. However, if this conflict continues, the world's protector which is said to be the true dragon would be awakened, so the gods have no choice but to join hands instead. So the gods created a world where they can live on their own, and they made a pact and left this world to its own devices. But all of these were just according to the myth, based on what Aesir has remembered. It seems like Aesir is back in the Dwarven Kingdom and is now spending time with Wynne playing chess. With the Fodal Empire's problem settled, he and Wynne were granted citizenship by the presiding king. Since this is the first time an elf has been granted such a thing, Aesir can't help but brag about it. Aside from that, it seems like for Aesir this was such a good thing, since if Asvald was the one who granted it to them when he became king, there is a big chance that the citizens would be angry about it, as they would see Asvald as having favorites. On top of that, it seems like Aesir also plans on having a meeting with Irina, since they have some matters to take care of. With Wynne finding out about this, he can't help but ask Aesir to let him join, since he also badly wants to see Irina as well. After they played some chess, Wynne then asked Aesir to teach him some of his new sword techniques. Ever since Aesir came back from Fodal, Wynne can't defeat him anymore. But Wynne made it clear that Aesir shouldn't take it easy on him, since he wants to win on his own merit. Now that Wynne is already 24 years old, or around 12 years human age, he has been really keen on learning more about forging and swordsmanship, which makes Aesir quite proud. With this much dedication, Wynne is definitely becoming an adult himself. To think that Wynne, all grown up, somehow makes Aesir quite emotional. At the back of his mind, he wishes to take care of Wynne just a bit longer. But as much as possible, he tries to tell himself not to worry about this kind of thing at all. One year later, it seems like Irina finally has some updates. According to her, the elves who had previously worked as adventurers were mostly the ones who agreed on their proposition for elves to trade armor and weapons. Although this is not what they were expecting, it is still a relief that there are still some who are willing to hear out their proposal. But for now, while waiting for Irina's next reply, Aesir wants to take a bath. Not in a sauna, but a hot tub. So he went on to ask Asvald if there was a hot spring across the area. When he heard there was, he immediately decided to visit the site, taking Wynne with him. But to his surprise, it seems like Asvald, together with around 50 other people, started coming with him. Weeks later since they arrived at the site, the dwarves have finally built the dream hot spring Aesir wants to have. But to his surprise, what the dwarves made was less a bathhouse and more a fortress instead. As time passed by, it seemed like the bathhouse had become quite popular among the dwarves. So Aesir made it an aim to let the elves appreciate hot springs the way dwarves have. So for that matter, he should finally wrap up the welcome preparations while he still has the time. Two months later, the group of elves arrived, entering the dwarven country. Some of the elves can't deny the fact that they were quite surprised at the fact that dwarves and elves see each other now in a different way, considering how the two races saw each other before. But it seems like not a single dwarf gives them a second thought. To Asvald's explanation, Aesir's presence in the kingdom has definitely altered how the dwarves see elves now. So the guests shouldn't worry about any of that, as long as they behave according to the rules of the kingdom. With that being said, the introduction has finally started. Three were adventurers named Jellica, Tormis, and Kyuo. The last one is Horacio, an elf who has been wandering minstrels, traveling the lands. Lastly is Levis, who is an artist who has worked for nobles, painting palaces and portraits, but seems to love landscapes so much more. 
Hearing this made Asphalt realize that these elves might have a hard time adjusting, since it will surely take a while before they all can get used to living amongst the dwarves. So he tells them not to push themselves and try to relax as much as possible. But to their surprise, it seems like the elves that came to the dwarven country fit in pretty smoothly. However, it seems like they get along so well that Aesir can't help but feel ever so slightly irritated. On a side note, it seems like Elvis has been doing pretty well winning over everyone, considering her portraits of the children and their grandparents are quite popular. The adventurer elves fit in too, since they have been doing odd jobs like going on a hunt, so they pretty much connect with the dwarves in the ways they were used to. Aside from that, it seems like the elves race is now in debt to Aesir for being able to bring all of the kinds together. So as a payback, they would like to give Aesir everything they have to offer. That is why Aesir now aims to make sure that the elves don't regret meeting them halfway on this. With that said, there is a lot of work to be done for that to happen. Elves could, for instance, export things like fruit liqueurs. Now the problem lies in what arms they'd import, considering elves can't stand metalwork. That is why the two decided to talk to the dwarves to see if they were willing to take turns in crafting for the elves. This suggestion was quite something to Irina, since setting goals one step at a time is such a great thing. If both dwarves and elves have kindred spirits working towards the same goal, the gap between the two races will definitely end in no time. Now that everyone is already gone, all of them are having a great time drinking together in the pub, living their best life. But it seems like among all, Elvis is having the best time ever, considering she can now get a traveling caravan and see the world. Hearing this made Aesir wonder what he did with his life. Since he had plans on what to do with his time for a good while now, what will he do once that's all done? Knowing that he has no small amount of self-indulgence, he starts to wonder if he will spend more of his time with the elves. But since he is not so sure about that now, he decided to just think about it some other time. Fast forward, it has been three years since the elves arrived here. Dwarven elven commerce is gradually filling out and becoming more of a reality. Aesir has also found some talented smiths who would help him craft equipment to export to the elves, Garav and Rajadol. Aside from that, the traders who have been in charge of going to Fodol came to Aesir as well, stating that they think the trade between dwarves and elves are shaping up to work out pretty well. On the other hand, Asvald is now next in line for the throne, and elven dwarven commerce is actively in progress. Aside from that, Wynn has also been improving in his smithing, to the point that he started doing jobs for customers. As everything is going well, Aesir now aims to fulfill one of his promises, which is to go back to Ludria after 10 or 20 years, which now happens to be the perfect timing, and it seems like Wynn also plans to come along with him as well. As they say goodbye, Wynn can't help but get a little emotional when he is saying his goodbyes to Asvald. By the time they parted ways, Wynn's tears had finally dried out, and unlike when they first arrived, he set off, walking forward on his own two feet. As soon as they arrived at Ludria, a lot of things had already changed. Two of Keha's children now have their own family. Aside from that, it seems like the whole dojo has transformed completely. As they started to talk about what had happened with them these past few years, Keha happened to have asked Aesir if he was okay with the fact that Wynn was getting stronger than him. However, the thought that his son is improving makes him happy. However, knowing that Wynn is growing into a man who will decide on his own, Aesir can't help but feel a bit sad. That is why Keha insisted on training Aesir once again, so that they will have a bout in three years. Two years later, as Keha and Aesir finally come back from their training, Aesir immediately went to the Viscount in order to pay a visit to the grave of the White Lakes members. Two months ago, Kreas died, then Maretna followed after him, which is expected considering both are pure humans. So with much respect, Aesir went on to pray to their grave. But aside from him, Irina is present as well. Knowing that Irina and the two somehow had quite a relationship before, Aesir knows that their deaths must have been painful for her. That is why he tries to comfort her when she needs it the most. At the back of Aesir's mind, the anguish Irina is feeling at this very moment is something he is sure he will go through in the not too distant future. So as much as possible, he tries to prepare himself as early as now. Aside from the members of the White Lakes team, Rodner, the first city guard that Aesir got close to, has also passed away. As he says his goodbyes to these wonderful people who have become a big part of his life, he and Keha then go back to the dojo. As three years have passed, the bout between the father and son has finally begun. The non-stop training they were able to receive definitely caused them to improve drastically, and their fighting techniques now are beyond comparable. However, as much as possible, Aesir tries his best not to get defeated as soon as he remembers Keha's statement, telling him not to be easy on Wynn since there is a big chance that this fight will become Wynn's lifetime inspiration to work hard and reach his goals no matter what. And just like that, it seems like Keha was right. Immediately right after their fight, Keha went on to inform Aesir that he would be going to the west, the land of the beastkin and other dangerous creatures to hone his skills. At first, it seems like Aesir is against this decision, but in the end when he realizes that this is for Wynn's good, he just goes on to cry his eyes out at the fact that his once little immature son 
has now finally grown to be a fine young man. Although for sure, Wynn will encounter countless struggles from this point on, Aesir knows that the young man will be able to overcome them in ways he himself has never thought of. That is why, he will support Wynn in his endeavors from now on. A year later after Wynn left, it had already been six years since Aesir returned to the dojo. As of today, a number of smithing apprentices are also flooding in. But there is one little catch. It seems like Keha's granddaughter Soha has decided that she wants to become a blacksmith, and it seems like the family is really not against it. As it turns out, Soha is doing all of this so that she can support her brother and family in the future. As a result, Aesir does the very best he can to make sure Soha is supplemented with the knowledge that she needs to grow as both a swordsman and a blacksmith. A few years later, when everything was going great, it seemed like Keha's health had been declining dramatically. Considering she can feel that her time is already near, she tries to bid her last farewell to Aesir. For the last time, she asks Aesir to get her sword for her, and as she sways the blade into the wind, Aesir can't help but get mesmerized by it. Seeing her do this made Aesir realize that this would definitely be the summation of Keha Yosugi, and it was not that long before Keha fell to the ground. Before she closes her eyes for good, she first expresses how much she loved Aesir from the beginning till now, causing Aesir to cry a bucket. Soon after, the burial was complete, and once Aesir saw that through, he decided to set out on his own. Although everyone in the dojo tried to stop him, deep inside, he just wasn't in the mood to stay in one place any longer. As he starts his travels, he also starts to read the last letter Keha has written for him. In the said letter, Keha promises that she will always be on Aesir's side, even if the memories they had start fading. So long as Aesir can hold a sword, she promises to be there to protect him no matter what. Aside from that, Keha also stated that she should go without saying. She will be happy if Aesir remembers her for a long time. Reading this emotional letter has caused Aesir to come up with the decision to head east to where Yosugi Ryu was born. With the best power that he can, he will make sure to pick up as many stories of her as he can so that he can return to her grave one day and share them with her. For him to be able to do just that thing, he decided to come along with the elf caravan, which Elvis has mentioned to him before. Although Aesir has the choice to just walk to his next destination, he ends up deciding with this option considering the caravan receives the letters wind sends from the west, and Aesir also doesn't want to be alone for now. Despite his not wanting to talk that much, he still wants to hear others talking. That is why he thinks this is the best place for him to be present. As time passed by, Aesir then was informed that Palogia, the place he once passed through when he was traveling to Velestrica, has now fallen to ruin, and is now known as Chiotica. It seems like their issues with the neighboring country have ultimately ended with their own destruction. As a result, they are now known as the vassal state of Velestrica. On a positive note, it seems like the city has been getting better. People have grown so close to the spirits that they now have access to clean drinking water, which, as Aesir remembers the town, didn't have before. After traveling for a while, the whole team just decided to rest up for a bit, so they went on to arrange their sleeping area. Before Aesir leaves them for good, the team asks how the High Elf plans to head to the east. It seems like Aesir will charter a boat in the United League, and then stop in Bardis and Oratanen to gather information on the wetlands, which is a place that is known as the Lizardman's territory. Since Aesir doesn't have that much time in the world anymore, some of the members then helped him with his map, and they eventually headed to the nearest town to start off with their day. With everyone playing some sort of instrument, Aesir started telling the kids a story that was inspired by what happened to Palogia today. The story communicates very effectively that elves can teach one if they are nice, and their wrath is terrible and frightening. So if the knowledge of elves and the spirits becomes more commonplace, Aesir hopes that he can lead people to be good neighbors to one another. That same day, when the night finally bit, Aesir went on to assure the other elves that there was no need for them to get pressured into becoming so great, since everyone definitely has their own pace. So right now, the only advice he can give is that for them to just learn whatever they can as much as possible. First, they need to know if something piques their interest, since if there is, then they can start off with that. After all, once one has something to orient oneself towards, gaining experience would be a lot easier. As days pass by, it seems like it is already time for Aesir to leave to head to his destination. During his last night on the caravan, Irina invited him to have a drink. It seems like Irina is worried about the fact that Aesir will be off on his own from now on, considering it's a bit lonely to be alone. But Aesir assures her that it would not be the case at all. However, just to be sure, Aesir went on to ask if she wanted to come, and surprisingly, she declined, stating that she also had a few works that needed to be done. Hearing this gave so much relief to Aesir, knowing that Irina could now stand on her own, strong and independent. However, it seems like Irina has some personal request, and that is for Aesir to tell something important to those people if he happened to have come across the Wild Lake, aka the Titan above the clouds. And just like that, Aesir finally starts with his travels. 
and he finally ends up in Bardis. As soon as he stepped in, he could immediately tell that this town had a similar feel to Vistcourt, a place where adventurers gather. As he roams around, he goes on to decide to find a place that he would feel safe staying in, even if it is a bit more expensive than others. As soon as he got inside, he then started to tell himself that this was finally the right time to prepare for his travels to the wetlands. But for now, he first needs to learn about the monsters he will possibly run into, and see which are edible to eat, considering crossing the wetlands will take some time. Since he wants to enjoy the next leg of his journey, he needs to know how to properly prepare the food and get rid of the muddy stench as much as possible. Upon starting off with his journey, he was able to come across a number of monsters along the way, and it seems like he was also able to rest quite pretty well at night, which is a great thing considering he is investigating day and night. But it seems like the challenges don't stop from coming at Aesir one after another, almost got eaten alive by a croc. Aesir tries his best to ensure that he kills this creature off, so it can be added to his food collection. Although he didn't learn as much as he would have liked from Bardis, but he knows deep inside that once he gets the hang of it, living smack dab in the danger zone isn't so bad anymore. Aside from that, with the help of the spirits, fighting off this creature wouldn't be that much of a struggle anymore. One month later wandering through the wetlands, Aesir suddenly felt a presence watching him from behind. As he takes a closer look at it, he is sure that it is definitely something humanoid. As a result, he ended up with the conclusion that this might be the infamous long thought extinct lizard man. Since he didn't want to approach and give the wrong idea, he just smiled and waved at it. As he continues with his journey, Aesir starts to get excited at the fact that there is a halfling in the Great Plains where he is headed now. For quite some time now, he has been pretty much excited about meeting them one way or another. A month later, after his long travels in the wetlands, he has finally reached the Great Plains everyone is talking about. Upon entering the field, a herd of wild and monster horses welcomes him. Seeing these horses somehow brings back memories for Aesir. As he is deep into his thoughts, an impactful smack of wind then brings him back to reality. To his surprise, it is actually the wind spirit that wants him to follow it to a certain location. This made Aesir wonder since the spirits can't actually conceptualize how to wield their powers outside of simply operating in nature. They have the freedom to pursue whatever catches their attention. So it is odd that a wind spirit would be so attached to someone or something, considering they are freely flowing in air, unlike fire and water spirits who make strong attachments to one place. But since this is the wind spirit's doing, Aesir has no choice but to do as it says. As they finally reached their destination, Aesir was shocked to see that a number of armed men started attacking a relatively small village. As a result, Aesir ended up scaring the bad guys away, causing the people of the village to thank him endlessly. As he was invited into the meeting, based on Aesir's observation, these people are actually nomads, considering they live in a nomadic hut. The villagers had then went on to thank Aesir for rescuing the village from Dahlia's army. A little girl named Selung then introduced herself as the wind reading oracle for the tribe of Balm. Aside from that, she is also known as the wind child. Seeing this girl made Aesir wonder if she could indeed see the spirits. But the question is, why does the wind spirit care so much about Selung, considering wind spirits should be free and unrestrained? whereas Selang seems to be much the opposite. However, as Aesir takes a deeper look into it, he finally realizes that this tribe is putting all of the responsibility on a kid's shoulder, which is something he can't tolerate. That is why instead of rescuing the tribe and moving on, he knows that it would really not fix this dilemma at all. The tribe of Balm and the tribe of Dahlia are nomadic tribes that reverse the winds that blew across the plains. Their quarrel originates with the wind child, Selang, and the flame child, a young boy who is unnamed. The flame child arrived as though he materialized from the ether. The tribe of Dahlia leveraged his power to plunder the nations to the south. This created problems for Baum, who relied on trade with those nations. Very quickly, a backlash against nomadic tribes emerged from the people of the south, and without them, Baum became impoverished. Although the two tribes held countless talks, they all just ended up with more quarrels. Selang's father and most of Baum's able-bodied men were slain in the process. As a result, all that is left of Balm are the women, children, elderly, and young and experienced fighters. Lately, the Dahlia tribe has been kidnapping mostly children, so the higher-ups have no choice but to ask for Aesir's help. As he eats the food the tribe has prepared for him, Aesir thinks that he has some grasp of things. It seems like the spirit wind did ask a favor of Aesir, and in order to actually manage that favor, he needs to do two things. First, make sure the flame child is a non-issue, and second, Balm needs some form of self-defense in their weakened state. So, Aesir can pretty much teach Selang how to better commune with the spirits. However, Aesir is not sure if Selang is up to this, considering Balm has been trying to abuse her powers for quite some time now. So, Aesir thought that the quickest way to do all of this was to eliminate the tribe of Dahlia to the last man. However, it seems like Aesir would do nothing like that, considering that is not how he takes care of things. 
but when he told the tribe panel that he didn't plan on killing the flame child, everyone started acting a bit off, angry and frustrated at the suggestion. As a result, the meeting ended quite abruptly. As Aesir steps out of the tent, Selang's little brother Shuro then approaches him, begging the high elf to protect his sister no matter what. Reminding him of Wynn, Aesir now has one more reason to fight beyond obliging the Wind Spirit's request. Some days later, the army of Dahlia is back again, but this time around, Aesir is already waiting for them at the front gates. While thinking of ways to defeat these large numbers, Aesir finally remembered the adventurer's party, White Lake, which was fully formed in their prime. Trying to find the flame child among them, Aesir uses the divine art of pyrokinesis, and before things get out of control, he finally gets his eyes locked onto his target. Knowing that there is no escape with Aesir, the flame child eventually stops resisting, marking Aesir's victory. Although some of the villagers were quite angry at the fact that Aesir didn't even bother to kill the flame child, Selang still went on to give her deepest gratitude to the High Elf. Seeing Selang take control of the situation made Aesir realize that she is indeed somewhat capable as any adult would be in her position. But then, Aesir is still left to wonder, what kind of person hides behind that mask exactly? The next day, it seems like Shuro and the others want to learn how to commune with the spirits for battle. However, Selang already tells them that this will not be a simple play at all. But as Aesir thinks about it, it seems like teaching Shuro would be of great help in the long run. As soon as the sun was up, Shuro together with Selang then went on to the field to start their lessons. It seems like Aesir ended up deciding to teach Selang how to commune better with the spirits, while also teaching Shuro how to wield a sword. Aside from that, Aesir is also planning to teach Juyol, the flame child, how to fight without relying on his special abilities. This made Juyol quite shocked since he sees Aesir as a foe, so there is no way the High Elf would teach him anything. Hearing this made Aesir smile, so he went on to assure Juyol that it really isn't the case since he didn't even see him as an enemy. Juyol's special ability is his pyrokinesis. However, that is his only card, and without it, he is pretty much defenseless. But more than that, Juyol is still just a kid and Aesir doesn't want his life to boil down to being a living weapon. Aesir aims to give Juyol a life he deserves to live. Since the three have only ever been asked to make use of their inherent talents, Aesir wants them to learn new things, like unfamiliar things. Like his masters before him, Aesir can give the three the strength to find a better future. As a result, he stayed with the Balm tribe for a time, and when winter gradually visited the plains, the tribe moved further south. From there, they took an excursion into the southern country of Vivinol. There, Aesir tries to help the tribe by bringing up the trading business they had before. Although the southern citizens are still wary of them, it seems like Aesir's plans are slowly coming to pieces. However, comments regarding Dahlia's tribe somehow affect Juyol so much. That is why Aesir aims to make him feel seen and loved, as he doesn't want the young man to wind up trapped in self-pity forever. One year later, bit by bit, Juyol's position has been changing. He has now done a lot to help Balm, and it seems like people of the tribe find it hard to harbor hatred for those who earnestly work for their benefit. As a result, they don't shun Juyol anymore. In fact, they even openly greet him now. Every single thing he has done there has changed the position he is in, but even then, it only seems to give him more to agonize over. Over the years, the three have grown at their own pace, which makes Aesir quite happy. However, along the way, it seems like they have gradually lost people along the way as well. Since these old fogies are the first to have condemned Juyol before, Juyol ended up asking Aesir in a duel if Aesir plans to rectify the way he humiliated him three years ago. Just as the fight started, the deep emotions emitted in each other's aura covered the whole field. As the fight intensifies, Juyol finally shows off what he truly has, flame and sword working in unison, a sight that Aesir has been wanting to see for the longest time already. But in the end, he missteps once again, causing him to fail eventually. However, to his surprise, instead of getting killed by Aesir, he was actually set free and allowed to go back home to Dahlia. What makes this farewell more emotional is that Shuro and Selang were the ones who sent him off. Two years later, everyone is slowly growing fast. Selang has been improving her skills and has gotten strong over the years. And yet, Aesir still has no grasp of what it is she wants, or what it is she thinks. So Aesir wondered if maybe she had the freedom she desired from the very start. These past two years, Dahlia and Balm have resumed their mutually beneficial trade. Apparently, Juyol took power as the leader of Dahlia, while Shiro became a real expert at swordplay. All that to say, there's nothing keeping Aesir here anymore. As a result, he finally gets back to his journey moving on from the plains. But one thing is for certain, he's leaving this place with a nice story to share.